Hi, Kamel. How are you? I'm well. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you fine. And I can hear you fine as well, which is nice. It's been a while. Mm, the whole pandemic ago. I know, exactly, actually. Because we first, we last met in Lahore when we were wrapping up the exhibition. And that was literally just before all of this kicked off. I know, it seems so long ago, actually. It seems very long. Sorry, I went I through like four telling... outfit changes because I wasn't sure what Instagram was okay with. <laughs> How are you? So did I. I put on makeup for the first time and literally, I think the last time we met was the last time I had makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing well. Um, I was just telling everyone how we first met a few years ago in New York and how proud I am that we were yeah. finally able to exhibit together in, um, well, earlier this year in February. At yeah, it was such a pleasure. At... Thank you. It was literally and one of the I'm... funnest shows that I've done in uh, in Pakistan, and particularly, I, I mean, I was raised in Lahore, as you know, and uh, to be able to work in, in a public space like the Plaza Cinema, where we'd all kind of grown up going to see movies, was an enormously uh, um, emotional experience, a lot more than I thought it would be. Um, it was a way to engage with a city which I had not had the chance to do before. What was wonderful was that we had so many people coming by who'd kind of come to the Plaza Cinema for their first date. And, mm. <laughs> and and they were really happy to be able to move through the exhibition, move through the different rooms, because obviously you know this, but for everybody who doesn't, the exhibition was designed in a fairly immersive manner where viewers were invited to step into the artist's thought process in many ways, the artist's reality in many ways. Mm. And different artists, included your, including yourself, responded in a variety of different um, means in a sense. And yours was one of the showstoppers of the exhibition. And I really appreciate the time that you took, the effort that you took, and sort of the, the finesse with which the work was placed as well. And I was wondering whether you wanted to chat a little bit about that. What was, yeah, definitely. were you surprised by the responses? Because I know I was. I'm, uh, I'm always surprised by the responses. I'm surprised if anyone wants to look at work anywhere in the world, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, but generally with, with that work particularly, it was... Um, the, the space demanded a certain amount of sensitivity to it because it was such a vulnerable space. It, it had been through so much and it was grand, but at the same time quite decrepit in the way that it had been taken. I mean, it's just an old building in Lahore, right? And so yeah. there's a certain amount of wear and tear and you could see it, but it was, a, it was a very strong building. And yet when I walked in, when you took me into that space, I came to see you a couple of weeks or a month or so before the, uh, two months actually, but when we were talking about uh, the initial concept of the show. And you were kind enough to show me that room. And it just, yeah. at the time, as you remember, it was filled with um, filing cabinets and dead pigeons and things like that. And so, it, but it, looking at the, the the scaffolding of it, you could tell it, it just, to me, it screamed out to be like a very intimate space. And in retrospect, now when I think about the intimacy and the, and the contemplative aspect of uh, creating like a, a, a silent chapel in that way, it does become... It's a different thing post Corona to think about a place where you can be alone with your thoughts uh, and whether. That's true. So um, just to give a little bit of background, because I know we sort of launch right into everything. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Cool. No, that's my fault actually, because I got nervous about it turning on. Um, Kumail spends his time between Lahore and New York. He is a painter and a writer, and a lot of his work has sort of started from looking at religious iconography, religious um, representations not just of Islam, but of other religions as well. And he's since expanded his work, moving far beyond that in many ways. For the Sagar Theatre show, Kumail took, you know, looked at this office space that was filled with desks and he turned it into a very private meditative chapel. And I remember I used to often just go there and sit down when I was having a difficult day. And I know a lot of people who went into the, which is often, a lot of people who went into the space really felt very much at peace. And right. now I look back at that time and I think we don't, didn't really know at that time what really being alone is like or really being in your own space. Um, mm. I know I've started meditating quite a lot recently and I wanted to ask you, Kumail, being in New York, how has it been for you recently with Corona, with spending a lot of time with your thoughts? Well, not great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm in, as, as you say, I'm in New York. I arrived here about uh, a month and a bit ago. 
And the culture shock that you, sh I, I spend half of my time in, uh, well, I used to spend half of my time in Lahore and half of it in, yeah. in New York. I'm not sure what that's going to be like in the future, but for the last six months or five months or so, I was in uh, Lahore doing a show and then doing um, stuff for your show and putting, because a lot of the stuff required you to be in situ. But mm -hmm. when I came here, I'm used to a certain amount of culture shock. You kind of stop and um, have to get acclimatized again to uh, any number of things, right? Um, but this time it was, this time it was a little bit different because I arrived, I think on the last, I left on the last, one of the last flights out of Pakistan, there was still a awareness that Corona had taken over and the world was still kind mm. of a little bit scared. The Americans had not woken up to that fact yet. So I arrived, there were five people on my flight and it's a flight of, as you know, like usually there are about a thousand wow, people on yeah. these planes, but there were five people on the entire flight, which was great, but also terrifying. Um, and so when we landed, uh, there was also no one in immigration. And so these kinds of things had kind of alerted me to the fact that something was different this time. And it took only about a day for New York to close down after I arrived here. And that, that's when it, the timeline was. And so it was a very quick turnaround. Um, and almost immediately I went into uh, social isolation. And at the, we were talking a little bit about this earlier, but what I did find as an artist, what was interesting about specifically seeing New York was that Growing up, I think we've all seen cities, uh, the streets of New York and the visuals of New York. Um, we associate empty New York with disaster. That's always been the mm -hmm. visual that we kind of keep between those. If you have a disaster movie, if a meteor is hitting and New York is empty, if aliens are coming, New York is empty. If uh, a tsunami is hitting, if an earthquake is coming, New York is empty. And they often show that the graphics revolve around something iconic like this city. And I found that I started getting triggered when I go to the grocery store just to see empty streets, which usually you'd never see uh, an empty street here ever at any time of the day or night. And to go at noon and see Broadway just completely derelict and not just derelict, but shuttered. And so people have put um, wooden, uh, these wooden ply boards on their shop windows to make sure people don't uh, break in. And with the result that you're staring at a street that used to be bustling and full of people uh, and an iconic street, any one of them. Um, and you, they're, they're boarded up, they've got all of these graffiti. It's, it's this very derelict kind of visuals. It looks very- um... It's such a different experience at the end of the day. And I think yeah. that that's probably what makes it even more difficult because as an artist, I'm sure you're used to spending a lot of time by yourself. Painting for many people, yeah, I don't luckily. know about you, is a very solo experience. But when you go out into the world, you're very yeah. used to seeing people around you. You can choose to see friends of yours. But in this scenario, in this situation, it's very difficult to see anybody. And I saw a video recently that someone sent of Lahore and exactly the same thing. It's entirely empty, entirely different. And nothing is going on. You can, I think there was like one motorcycle on the streets. Yeah. And to see a city like that, that generally is filled with traffic jams, yeah. crowds, you know, d dirt and pollution, right. which is suddenly transformed so quickly, is really quite I mean, on the one hand, you're terrified, and the other hand, it's quite lovely not to be around people. And yeah. going to the grocery store, people suddenly avoid being in your personal space. That's quite a victory for anyone before, before 2020. <laughs> you um, know, I'd actually found different... that as well. It's often, it's almost nice not having to speak to, in fact, you're the first person I think I've spoken to outside of my immediate family in quite a while. I'm very because flattered. although there, I know it's true, even though there are various apps and things that you can use, sometimes it's just such an effort to try and have that conversation with anybody else that, yeah. I don't know. Are you managing to paint at all? So I'm not painting. I came back in, uh, in those two days before everything shut down. I got a text from my art supply store here, the, uh, just a generic text saying we're probably going to shut down. And so I went there and there was no one there. So I bought as much stuff as I, because again, I'd been away for six months in my studio here. I have a studio in New York, but it was empty. I didn't have a lot of stuff that I'd, um, you know, you have to restock every so often. So I yeah. went in there, bought a bunch of stuff and then realized after buying it that all of it is now, I can't go to the studio. Um, so it's sitting there. So I haven't been painting, but I bought uh, like a skeletal, a skeletal crew of my, um, so like one leaf of gold leaf. I bought some gilding supplies. But what I've been doing is a scroll. And I've kind of been oh. talking about it on Instagram a little bit, but essentially what I'll show you actually, if you want, yes, it's this, show. it's like, uh, it's a, it's a 50 foot roll of paper. And so I just, wow. and I open it like that. And then I just keep working on a little bit at a time. I'll try and show you some images from it. Um, Post-corona uh, art. Post-corona art. Yeah. I mean, I'm making this, well, I, I, I'll show you in a bit. It's a little, it's like, I have to unfurl 50 feet of this thing. And so it's a little bit. <laughs> Take your time. It's okay. Yeah. But it's like stuff like, um, I don't know if you can see that. That's like this yeah, Jesus. That's fantastic. I made that on Easter. 
you can see a lot of the hand of Fatima things there. Um, and then, yeah, so I'm just doing like, it's not meant to be, I didn't want to be someone who was hashtagging Corona art or things like that. But at no. the same time, it is a meditative, a lot of, as you say, um, one of the things that I did recognize after this entire thing happened was that I am privileged in, this, in the sense that I am used to spending extended periods of time alone. Exactly. And have trained myself to do that. I, it, writing requires it of you and painting requires it of you and you have to be. And for the last six months, I had been in social isolation working for your show. Uh, and there was a certain <laughs> amount of, uh, I didn't go out, you know, generally. Also in Lahore for the last six months, we were all dealing with the smog and breathing issues and things. So generally you weren't encouraged to go outside much anyway. So You've been I'd wearing be very masks sequestered. for the last year, by the way. Yeah, yeah, before they were cool. Masks in Lahore, <laughs> masks in New York. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's strange to see the things that you assumed were particular only to South Asia, Delhi, Lahore, um, are actually now global. And the visuals of masks mm. here, and how quickly that, that you can get used to these things. How quickly I'm used to standing in line for an hour and a half to buy chicken. It's amazing. I feel like one of those World War II widowers who like makes lipsticks from beetroot. Or, you know, there was, my father has all of these things that he said, well, I'll post war these to ration margarine and butter and stuff like that. Sadly, I can get all the and butter I want because I've been baking. Oh, yeah, God, I know. What have you been baking? Said, I didn't know that. Yeah, it turns out much baking? like everyone else in the world, I too have a banana bread recipe. Oh. I've, I've been, been baking, um, I've been doing like palaos. And um, I butchered a chicken the other day from scratch. But the strange thing is a uh, small apartment in New York is not meant for baking or cooking. Uh, that no, lifestyle it doesn't, um, it doesn't support it, but you have to, and it's good. I'm very lucky in the sense that uh, I can, I can kind of like, as I said, I, li I live by myself in New York and I've been cooking for myself. And so that's not necessarily a skill set that I had to learn, but it has been, it has been tough. They've been, if one's honest about it, there've been days even in the social isolation. It's, you're with your thoughts and it's fine to be alone but there was a certain sense of when you're working in isolation when you're working and that's the reason that you're isolated it's it's kind of self-generated this feels different this feels a little bit um work becomes a distraction and you're and in that sense i'm quite happy to uh to have like a the meditative quality of drawing right because people have drawing books adult coloring books and things like that and i'm really treating the work not in any way thinking about where this stuff will go or who will look at it or, but honestly, just getting back to the fundamentals of fun. Um, and so what I like about gold leafing is that it distracts me for an hour and a half. And so I can mm. sit down and do that and put on a podcast or listen to music. But there's some days in which I fight with my, the other voices in my head. Um, three, four days ago was not a great day uh, and ended mm. with a cheesecake. And the next day was better. Um, but there's small stuff. How was stuff. your scroll during that time? Was anything- The scroll, I try and do every, least... yeah, actually on the days in which it became a little bit, so I was a little bit happier when I was doing the Jesus, like, well, it's not Jesus, but I was a little bit happier with the Jesus figure. But then like there's other bits of it in which I'm working with India ink um, and stuff. And then you get, I don't know, there's some visuals. Can you see that? They're like visuals like that. I've been dealing with, um, I'm so sorry. There's no way for me to unfold this in a in an elegant no, no. fashion. So, but then I've also been looking. Worry. I mean, in that sense, Corona does kind of come up again and again as like different. Um, I've been thinking about just particles, and that's kind of work that I've been doing myself anyway. Um, yeah. Just like particles and God particles, and but what I did find was that I've become a little bit more sentimental. Um, and mainly that's because I started doing a drawing of my um, father and nephew. Um, and oh, just like small, yeah. I think of them as almost religious objects in the sense that you keep them to make yourself feel safer, right? I mean, that's the mm -hmm. essence of what a uh, hand of Fatma, like a, a, around your neck um, or uh, the, uh, the cross or a crescent or the word a lion on a, in a solitaire. It's, these are all little um, like magical talismans, right? That keep you, tasbis, tavizes, they're all the same in that way. They're meant to assuage your fear. And it's that aspect and of- Symbols. Symbols, And yeah, when you yeah, see them symbols. anywhere, you recognize them, regardless of whether you go to a church or you go to a mosque or you go to a temple, you automatically feel that sense of silence and quiet and safety mm. in many ways, because yeah. you feel that you're in a space where everybody believes at some level yeah. or the other. And, and what's interesting visually to me, at least about pandemics generally, uh, much like everyone else, you just, I've been researching other times in which these things have happened. 
So the art that came out of the HIV crisis, the art that came out of the Spanish flu, the art, but also the art that came out of the dark ages and stuff. Someone's there. <laughs> Yeah, my mom came by. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> I, <laughs> I gave them a very good No, but one of the other things away. that I'm super happy about is that I'm not living with someone right now during uh, the quarantine. I think I would have possibly killed anyone I was with because you know there'd be moments in which. <laughs> no, I feel quite um, lucky and blessed because I don't live in Pakistan usually, I live in London. And for the, a lo- after a very long time, my sisters, my brother and I are all at home with our parents and it's really yeah. lucky. You know, we've been doing things like yoga together or taking the time to meditate. I've started painting again in a slight mm. effort to get away from them in many ways, I think. But it's been really nice to have that special and very uh, rare family time for us. And I know not everybody has that. Mm. So I'm feeling very lucky and very blessed at this point. But at the same time, I do sometimes wonder what it would be like to be, you know, by myself for a little while. I mean, the thing <laughs> is, no one really knows. Hours, at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to, like, you have to find, I, I find that I got exhausted the first week. I don't know, most of the people on here would probably um, have the same reaction. I got sick of uh, WhatsApp calls and FaceTimes, and it was ex- not sick of, but it was exhausting after a yes, month or so. to try and keep up with everyone. To Agreed. keep up with everyone. I was getting a lot of phone calls. Uh, because I was in New York, obviously people around would hear the horrifying news and be like, are you okay? Yeah. Which is a natural kind of way to exist. I would do the same. I've been asking my friends. Yeah. Um, but it, it does become, a, you become a little bit exhausted realizing that you're craving solitude even during the solitude. <laughs> it's a yeah. bizarre experience. Um, but I, Mel, tell I, me, tell yeah, me a little yeah. bit about um, life in Lahore and growing up there. Because I know that you grew up there, then you moved to the states for university, I did. and then you went back to Lahore for a little bit of time, right? Before starting to come back and forth. Yeah, so I, uh, I we moved to Lahore when I was about five or six. Uh, we were born. I was born in the Emirates, and uh, we moved back. And my father's family is from Lahore, and we. Uh, I think I went, then went to high school there throughout, so like uh, grade one through uh, A-levels. Um, and then I left. Uh, growing up, that was fine. I tended, I didn't, what can I say about it? I mean, I... I well, I, I mean, I, I mean more from a sort of, because um, I know your work has imbibed a lot of symbolism, I think, yeah. of Lahore itself, especially the Sagar Theatre show. A lot of the work yeah. was almost an ode to Lahore. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. even in the scroll you were just showing, I noticed a lot of the hand of Fatma, like you mm. said, your father and your nephew, um, other objects that you saw growing up that gives you solace and right. peace in a sense. So I wanted yeah. to sort of ask about those as well. Those sort um, of experiences that may have led to some of your present practice. Well, in Lahore, actually, the one thing that did, uh, going to Majlis in Lahore was a deeply impacting experience mm-hmm. and going to, uh, during Muharram and uh, experiencing, honestly, if I look back at it, anything that made me feel different when I was growing up um, in Pakistan, and generally, I think anyone in high school also feels this way. Like if anything that yeah. makes you different sticks out as something that you eventually use later in your personality when you're developing it. Um, but I do think that being, uh, going to, Majlis and being aware of being Shia, that was a, something that really did have a um, an impact on the way I think, and also the imagery and stuff. It was actually a lot more. Uh, Lahore came a lot. It, it, these things came in my work only when I was out of Lahore, and when I was in America, suddenly did I realize that I was from Lahore and that I was brown, and that because before that the context was completely different. I never had exactly. to pretend that everybody, being exactly. yeah, everyone was in Lahore. Everyone was from Pakistan. Exactly. It was a very different thing. And then suddenly, when I moved to New York post 9/11, it was my the formulation of my identity was exceptionally um, different, and it was exceptionally mm-hmm. external because it was not decided by me. It was other people had suddenly decided that I have to stand in line for this many hours to get spot checked. I mean, uh, the the theater of security at the time was very, very robust. Um, and that's mm-hmm. kind of changed very recently only. Um, but actually, that's one of the things that COVID did was change the way that we think about what was necessary. So you can take bottles of water on airlines, whereas airports and airlines for the longest time were very, very um, hyper um, 
vigilant uh, militarized zone for me at least or it felt like there was a test that you had to go through i have a pakistani yeah, now, passport that was part of it now many con- companies are also seeing how you can work from home far more easily than they had anticipated and how people who are working from home actually work like they don't just yeah. run around yeah 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 so and, uh, this has brought out all sorts well. of things in which people are going to realize i just hope that I, we all have some kind of semblance of a life after this i'm not quite sure how that's going to work out well how have you been keeping sane because yes you've been painting obviously but now i want to ask who you who says i have something. been keeping sane <laughs> i went to the grocery store the well, other day wearing a full length yeah. sequined jacket and <laughs> get that there's no because i the laundry had run out of everything so it was just can i ask you something is this that sequined jacket that you wore in that ali sethi video because that was quite sparkly yeah it was actually i think really he is here to... somewhere he like just said I know, yeah it was exactly the it was exactly <laughs> that was that exactly is a very the classy fun Actually, that's a two-tone jacket, which if you rub it one way, turns gold. If you rub it the other way, turns black. It's a separate topic. I've but always I have wanted been... something. No, no, no. I've been meaning to buy one actually, and I have not done so yet. Yeah, um, I've been trying yeah. to keep sane by. Uh, I've been working out. I don't know if I am keeping sane, honestly, because it's been a month and one is surviving. Um, and I'm trying. Mm. The way I respond to this is by trying to become as structured as possible. So I wake up at nine. I work out at eleven. I Good. have lunch at one. I work between one to four, five. I talk to people in the meantime. I put on my uh, TV shows at seven. That for me helps me. The structure helps me mm-hmm. um, because I know I that if I just. I think for a lot of people. Hmm. Now tell me about the columns. Someone that you wants write. to see the jacket. I'll show you the jacket. Actually there are a bunch of these comments <laughs> that I hadn't even noticed. Yeah, um, no they've been I've been trying to ignore some of them because they're a bit distracting, but uh, they're wondering why you're not doing painting. Well, he's doing his scroll, which he's I'm doing a scroll. Yeah, earlier. and it's got some paintings in it. Um and the and, jacket, yes, we'll try and show you. And yeah. coming to tell me about the column that you write. Now I'm not sure if everybody here knows about it, but I came across it I suppose very recently. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, apparently it's been ten years. Yeah, yeah. and um, I it's write a column, a column for the Friday uh, Times. It's a column for the Friday Times. I uh, been writing it since two thousand and eleven. It started when I came back from the U.S. and I was just um, uh, asked to do this kind of like a kind of like a irreverent uh, take on what it is to move back and just life in Pakistan generally. And that's how it started. And it's called yeah. uh it's written under a pseudonym it's called it's written under fires kantawala um fires t kantawala but which people thought was a parsi girl for the better part of 10 years but that's and then they found uh, it was you or not yet? i don't think that they know it was i don't it's not okay. necessarily that um i was hiding it it was just easy at the time when i moved back uh i wanted to keep my art and particularly this separate and also i wanted a certain amount of freedom Mm-hmm. since i was writing in loho about loho i wanted a certain amount of anonymity not because i was going to say anything that i wouldn't be able to say to someone's face but or about someone but mainly because i just uh, it allowed a certain you could just take the words or what it were or what they were mm-hmm. um and it was fun it it was also nece- it was necessary at the time 2011 was a very different time in pakistan particularly loho um to move there it was a, it was more um I mean, there were suicide bombings, and there was there was a general sense of menace that was kind of pervading a lot of uh, various aspects of society. I remember, like even people that was around the time that the fashion weeks were coming up, and mm-hmm. um, and sorry, a friend of mine, hi. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that that's how it um, the th- that's how that worked. But um, I've kind of forgotten your question, though. What were we <laughs> were about talking the about? Really. The column, right? Okay, That's how it started. And in a so. in a way, it's an interesting foil to your paintings, not because many of them. I mean, I know that they're steeped in religious iconography, but some of them are also fairly social scenes of people hanging out together, mm-hmm. dressed up in these fabulous gararas, wedding scenes. Some of them now are scenes from your childhood of these mm-hmm. bathers in the canal. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the bathers are a big. The bathers. I mean, it all kind of comes from different. And at the versions. same time, the, the so sorry, the, the column is also very much about what you see around you. So I like the juxtaposition between the paintings and the the writing. So first, mm-hmm. I want to ask about that. There's another question. Follow up. Yeah. No, I mean the writing is like a. Um, I was trained in journalism, and so I was trained with uh, short form, quick. uh turn around kind of writing and i was i happened to be good at it when i tried 
I've also done long form and stuff, but what I did find in journalism was that my voice was far too strong, and that I could never mm. make myself. Um, a lot of journalism has to be completely uh, opaque in terms of the writing. You can't tell who the writer is, and it's all about conveying information. I was not mm-hmm. that person. Um, no. <laughs> I, it just kind of bubbled out, right? Like whenever I wrote. So then when I when I started writing the column and stuff, um, that was just. I I think of it obviously as the same thing to many people. Uh, perhaps from the outside, it doesn't look like that. To me, they're similar. Um, they're similar viewpoints. They're just different in the way. So. But the things that I'm looking at in writing, um, they just attack different subjects, and you have to talk. Of, you can lead someone to a conclusion with writing, whereas with painting mm-hmm. and imagery, it's a very different thing. You're trying to evoke it. You're hoping that whatever you're trying to evoke is already present within them, and that they have mm-hmm. a certain amount of. Uh, uh, a relationship with whatever it is. So if it's a it's a symbol of the hand of Fatma, perhaps they know what it is, perhaps they don't. I was, for example, one of the things that I realized when I went abroad, one of my first interests in using Islam as a way to talk about identity was the fact that you could be Muslim whether or like I was abroad and I could understand the cultural references of Indonesians and Moroccans and the and Indians. And that was a very different sense than for, for example, what I'd assumed I would feel, right? So I felt this affinity to this. To this like larger Just cultural landscape culture yeah mm-hmm. and Just also to examine identity. to examine is like an english i was i primarily spoke english growing up there was a very current post-colonial uh relationship that i had with with lahore generally and particularly going to an english-speaking school there we have a very there was a very um uh I, I, I was trying to figure out what that relationship was and how much of it, for example, how much of colonial art was something that I was allowed to call my own, right? Like how much of mm. British art made during the Raj can we claim as art history in South Asia? And so one of the things in your, in the exhibition I did for you, in the piece for you guys was the, there was a picture of Jangi's Makpara, which is a, which is a, a mosque, it was a mausoleum in Lahore. But the painting that I used for it was done by an Englishman. And it's part of an English canon of art history of Raj pieces. And so there's a, I try and find the, these intersections of places where we can have multiple identities existing at the same time, which is essentially just a metaphor for all of us. As we now realize during this thing, right? You're not only yeah. one thing. There's so much bullshit, pardon the expression, that has just fallen away in, um, in this whole thing. Art fairs are one of them. Um, large uh, gatherings of people, I mean, outside of the age of the month stuff are clearly because apparently Corona doesn't like Fridays or masks. So I say. Mm-hmm. But there's just, there's, there, there's all these kind of multiple things happening, which is always fun. I think that those, those are the more interesting parts to, to play with in, um, in art. And it's fun when you can put, a lot of the imagery that I'm using in the scroll, for example, are icons. And so for, um, and by icons, I don't just mean um, pretty white women against gold leaf backgrounds from Russia. I just actually like looking even now, like uh, people's, uh, the round thing from people's Instagram, Profiles is now an immediately identifiable image for all of us. It's a language. It's, it's a vernacular. The way that um, the way that I message pops up, the blue versus mm-hmm. green, right? That's a those those boxes are now universal language in terms of what we think green means. We it didn't get delivered. Blue means it did. Those colors, those shapes, never existed before. And that's also coming into. I mean, like films, for example. Sometimes you see a an older film and you wonder why aren't they using their phone? Why aren't they just texting somebody? And the second yeah. that that Insta message pops up, you understand exactly yeah. what's going on. I know. I yeah. found myself going through the early um, seasons of Murder, she wrote recently, and recognized that if they just had a mobile phone, literally 90% of the murder cases that Marple had would not have existed. And so much of it is a product of your time. That's true, yeah. Um, That's but time true. is also something that we all have a lot of right now. So. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, because I was speaking with someone, actually Hormat, who's on, um, I think was one of the viewers, and she was talking to me about how she started paying a lot of attention to time recently. And I wonder how that played into your work as well over the years, yeah. especially right now. Are you thinking about time differently? Are you... Considering I wasn't before. Have... This made me. Yeah. This made me definitely because the project that the scroll project, like I said, is not. It's not narrative. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not about a particular thing. It hasn't come from or is leading towards a, uh, an end goal. Other, the only uh, basis I have for it is to record time, and so mm-hmm. I started it on April first when I knew that we would be in quarantine for at least the next month. 
And so I yeah. thought, okay, as a temporal experience, if you do something every single day, whether or not it's good, even recording the, the passing of time becomes an art piece in itself. So it's not so much yeah. about what, uh, how long something took you, or how many hours you did, but actually just a ritual of using it to showing, to showing the time passed. And that that mm. scroll or that object becomes a much more, uh, it, uh, much more self-aware of the fact that it is documenting a, um, a passage of time, which I don't think, mm -hmm. I mean, like you said in the beginning of this, we met like a month ago, but we didn't think in the time from when you and I were talking about what we were going to put into the show to the time that the show actually happened. That was not as hyper-vigilant uh, uh, a, a period of time as it is now, we're all super aware of how many days we are spending indoors. We're all aware of the passage of time in a way that is almost universal and unprecedented. Yeah. And for many people, it's just blurring. A lot of people message me saying, oh, sorry, we missed your talk. We thought it was, you know, we thought it was on about you know, what day. And I was like, no, today is Thursday. And many of them thought that it was Friday or Saturday right now. So I think that's yeah. also something that's happening. Time is just- I know, what is time? Hold of. Exactly, at the end of the day. Can I answer someone's question that just came in? Oh, yeah, of course. Someone, Which one? Iman Fatma714 asks why I put a mirror in the center. And so I don't, I don't know how many of you uh, who are on this saw the show at the Saga, but it had these three large um, four gold leaf panels that were like uh, eight feet tall. And in the middle of that was this rose petals and in the middle of the rose petal were a mirror. The mirror was partly to make an abstract uh, focal point. I didn't want it to be an object. I wanted it, we played around with that, but I wanted an object. And the second part was to almost make it look a little bit like water so that the, um, you had a much more elemental grounding. But I, for something, because there were so many visual elements in the rest of the, the piece, I wanted the thing that people focused on, the thing that everything was leading towards to be extremely clean and uh, abstract and uh, kind of blank in a sense and that you can project a lot of stuff to it. Although, fun story, someone stood on top of it, yeah, cracked it, took a that. selfie. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. But thank you so much for So I, I, everybody who came by, I kept talking about immersion and immersing themselves in the art. So a few people took it quite literally. Several of them asked if they could step on the mirror and one went ahead and did it. But, you know, that's all part and parcel of putting together an art exhibition, I suppose. Yeah. And um, Kumail, tell me a little bit more about the, that's something I've seen crop up. I don't know whether it's been recent. I think you've been working with gold leaf quite a lot, but now you seem to be painting directly on it. Right. And it's very, very beautiful the way that it's coming out. And I wanted to just ask what was going on. The gold leaf started about 15 years ago when I was trying to look at earlier, um, like I said, uh, you mentioned earlier, I was looking at art, uh, what Islamic art would look like if were it figurative. A lot of, um, mm -hmm. we have examples of that as well. But gold leaf is one of those objects that the moment you, oh, it's one of those things that when you use it in art, it has a very particular connotation. You think religious, you think iconography, you think not necessarily high end so much as institutionally um, institutionally verified for lack of a better term. And when I used it in everyday portraiture and stuff, it kind of elevates the subjects to something else. So I was interested in that idea, but it, I'd been mm -hmm. using a lot of it in um, as decorative elements or things uh, in the background. And I had been thinking a little bit about like what it would look like to paint on it. And it's not an easy thing to paint on. It takes a little bit of time, but it's the next logical step. It's also the act of defacing gold. Mm. And in the creation, for example, of a portrait, as you create this face, you're actively defacing the gold and the and 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 the leaf and the, the value of the leaf behind it. The which is not it's an, as well. The purity, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that you can't yeah. and so there's a certain amount uh, amount of um violence to that act, which is uh, to me, at least when I'm doing it, because I'm so trained and not touching the gold leaf, like making sure mm -hmm. that nothing touches it. So it's a very, it's a, it's a wonderful reversal to have, but also it's just visually, it makes it a, little, a lot more contemporary in the kind of issues that you're dealing with. You, uh, uh, my work tends to be a little bit more tight, I think, and I like having it loosen up and um, yeah, you get really like, nice. when you do like um, brushwork on gold leaf, you can see the gold coming through. Rembrandt used to paint on gold leaf, uh, which we don't, I, we don't really... Be it's quite difficult to handle as well because the surface is so very different from a canvas. The paint just must go in all directions. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the uh, surface is quite different. It took a little bit of time to get used to. Yeah. It's a little bit slicker, and so the brushwork uh, makes itself more conspicuous. But that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of moving towards that direction anyway. Um, but it, so, the one more sorry. thing, just about the gold leaf, yes, was that a lot ahead. of the portraits and stuff. I started using gold leaf as a skin tone because I wanted to remove yeah. race, um, which actually came. The idea came to me from a lot of. I've been looking at a lot of African American artists actually. Uh, and I've always, because that was an access point for me in American contemporary art, because it never made sense to me. Not, it never, not, I don't know. There was a certain amount of otherness that I felt with a contemporary American painting conversation that was happening. And mm -hmm. partly that was because they didn't use figures that much. There was a, there was a not necessarily, um, there was a disdain for figurative art, actually, with the abstract expressionist here and with American artists, a lot of them working. For but many I, years, I, actually. For many Even years. recently, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But I find a Almost lot of a uh, for painting. Mm, yeah, to a degree. Um, Recently, and then, but a lot of the art, the art that I would find that was contemporary that was using figures was um, art that came from uh, communities whose body was still political, and I think that that makes sense. My, me being brown and coming through an American airport means something. It 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 sets forth a particular set of events in motion, and I think that. Um, when the body is political, it features in, in art. Um, I mm -hmm. think part of the conceit of conceptual art is that it takes for granted how many of its practitioners would be white in that you can afford to then blank out your uh, racial identity or social identity because it does not affect, and it shouldn't in an ideal world, but that doesn't preclude people who want to, to then use the body as, uh, as a forum from which to like explore all of these things. And coming to that, I really love some of the patterns that you have as well. So Samir Shami really... has just asked a question. I knew, I know Samir because we share a birthday oh. together. Um, Samir, we, uh, hi, Samir. Um, Colin David influenced me the most growing up. Yeah. And yeah, you were saying, sorry, I interrupted. No, 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 I'm trying to remember now. Oh, yes, the um, backgrounds and the patterns in a lot of your art. Because I've noticed that those motifs are repeated and then they also seem to come from Islamic art history traditions like you wrote, I think mm -hmm. you mentioned somewhere that the Alhamra's design motifs played quite a role. Is that well, also quite conscious because of the bringing- Exceptionally, it back exceptionally. Yeah. Well, not necessarily South Asia, a lot of those are pan-Islamic. So when mm -hmm. I was doing these portraits initially, there were a lot of my friends who were Palestinian or Lebanese and uh, I was doing their portraits and using the Islamic, um, any kind of circular Islamic pattern. And I was using it as a halo, and that became mm -hmm. an immediate reference to what an Islamic halo would look like. And so one of the reasons, if I can go back to this, the halo is something that I <laughs> constantly come back to. Sorry. Um, but like, even with my nephew and dad and stuff, and this, oh, God, sorry. Um, this is such a treat, a thank you. Like, um, so you see the kind of black flames behind him. I have to add the gold leaf, yeah. but that comes from uh, Islamic, um, halo, early like Islamic mm. halo, in which they would use like flames to show, or gold leaf flames to show divinity. And so that's something that I lifted directly from there. And I've always been, but then there's always other subjects. Sorry, I'm trying to see if there's anything else. There's also this guy who's like a Krishna meets like figure. That's a different kind of halo, if that makes sense. So yeah, I mean, halos have always been important and a lot of the Islamic geometry came from the halos. Um, and the halos came from Islamic geometry. It was trying to mix the two together. Uh, in an effort, I think in retrospect, I realize now my younger self trying to reconcile what I thought were two disparate identities. Frankly, a lot, I mean, we've mostly got Pakistanis on this, but a lot of, um, so I guess we can say it, there was a lot of identity politics that I don't think anyone sorted through, <laughs> right? Like mm. I can only now look back to a post 9-11, Growing up in the, growing up, being a Muslim male who's got a beard, who's six foot four in America, in New York, post 9-11 was a very, it formed a lot of how I navigate through the American system. And yes, because it, what it, we didn't say earlier was that Kumail went to NYU for his undergrad and then he did his master's at the Pratt Institute. So you were really studying in New York for about six years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. six, uh, eight years. And then I, uh, and I was working, I was working at Amnesty International and moving back to Pakistan when I did, when I was 25, was a conscious decision. It was a decision mm -hmm. to, to actively move back without any kind of um, escape plan or, uh, or, or like another school degree or anything like that, but to just move back with this, with what at the time was my fear, which is that I wouldn't be able to make a life in Pakistan. How do I live there? How do mm -hmm. I work? 
um, and I, slowly I spent like five years and I moved out of my parents' house. I created my own house. I created a studio. And there are small things that kind of try to demystify living there to me. And that was very useful. But um, after a while, and then I just moved, I, got, I was doing the green card thing. And then I've been kind of going back and forth. But I've maintained a presence there consciously uh, in Pakistan. Because I do think that there is a different conversation to be had um, there. But that said, a lot of the conversations that I was trying to have there, the Americans, um, American art, I didn't, f well, it's only quite recently that it's come to talk, talk about stuff like identity politics in a way that is not um, reductive. Um, and there's a lot, there's just a lot more awareness now of like these different social structures. Privilege was not a conversation we had, right? Like in 2003, yeah. privilege, white privilege, passing privilege, um, any of these things. Uh, and so I think that's also quite I mean, interesting. There's been a lot more focus on sort of non-white, non-male authors, writers, artists. I mean, a yeah. friend of mine uh, in London has been reading books only by non-white female authors for the last couple of years. And it's really interesting mm -hmm. to see some of the books that she's choosing, the conversations and uh, that are happening within them. And they're so real for what we grew up with as well. Because if you come for these backgrounds, you do sort of feel similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a very perceptible shift. I mean, but that's also been ever since Arundhati Roy, even before. There's kind of the token um, woman of color trope in which you'd use, you know, that's existed throughout. But I think exactly. that the, um, I think that there's an enormous shift in the sense of not so much shifting towards them, but also looking at white male authors with the same lens. So it's not exactly. that they're extraordinary, but that these guys are ordinary as well, right? Yeah. It's an equation of the two. And being a bit more critical in a sense as Being well, a bit, yeah, anything. also like, why is it that we have to like focus on Nigerian authors who are writing about, like, it, why, for a while there, it seemed that there was only a particular kind of writing that was coming out of the developing world, right? Like a lot of the fiction that you would read from South Asia for a while had a very particular, there was a crit critique of it, but like, why does it have to be about um, yeah. any of the things that we've been can you do a fantasy epic based in South Asia can you do like a, you, you know um, any of those can things can you also write for your own people in a sense rather than just sort of writing towards everybody what about writing for South Asians and how does that change what you're writing which is also yeah. one of the reasons why I find your writing so interesting I keep drawing you back to that column and you keep running away from it <laughs> oh no yeah, yeah yeah we can talk about the column the column is different um, how in, uh, in terms of your point about how it is to talk to your own people, I am super aware that when I'm writing in English in Pakistan, I'm talking to a very, very particular and a very Elect, exactly. small group of people, right? And it's a it's an echo chamber. A lot of it is like Twitter, which is one of the reasons I'm not on Twitter, because mm. I just don't think that there's any point in echoing back to each other the same things and getting into these, right? Like there's a certain, you have to be aware. It's much like much like not to go back to contemporary art that quickly, but like when you have a lot of Pakistani graduate schools producing video art, a lot of those have are, I'm always thrilled to find that it's video art that's super aware of the fact that you need a generator to run it. And that yeah. creates a different kind of art, right? And so I think that with yeah. the, the um, I've now recently in the, when the first six, seven years that I was writing that, I was only, I was only thinking about it in terms of the, the newspaper and Pakistani readership, because I did want to make it particular to Pakistan. I have now since tried to expand that so that hopefully anything that you can read, uh, you can derive some kind of universal experience from. And that has made the personal become a lot more prominent in the column. So mm -hmm. I kind of bring it art and writing, actually. I think that the more personal you can get, the, the more real and frankly, the more truthful you can get. The more like universal the you are. It's one of the first rules, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very difficult. But it's also very because difficult you're in a allowing place like Pakistan. In, yeah, and you're allowing someone in, in like, the, uh, in a you know, gamut of different kinds of uh, tricky areas, right? Like, so secularism or freedom of religion, freedom of press. There's a lot of assumptions that you make when you write. <laughs> uh, or even when you paint. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the things that a lot of people commented upon when they came and saw your room at the Saga Theatre. They were so... I think grateful is the right word. Grateful that you had opened up yourself, your childhood experiences, paintings of individuals or of experiences that really impacted you growing up. And somehow they could relate because the Lahore, I mean, just to give a little bit of background, Kumail had painted uh, scenes of 
the canals of Lahore and of children swimming in them, individuals swimming in them. He'd painted um, a lot of motifs of the hand of Fatima, religious figures, um, superhero iconography as well. And I think this is something that a lot of young individuals and even older people could relate to. And they felt very, very, um, I'm running out of words, but very grateful, I suppose, to be able to step into this realm that you had opened up yourself with. And they One, felt that they could really see some of the things that had influenced you. Mm -hmm. um, one of, someone's asking what room was this at the Saga Theatre? It was the red room. It was the big, if you went no, in. No, no, not the, not the re no, the red room was Amra's. Oh, this sorry. One. Gold room, golden red. <laughs> Gold, golden red room, the golden meditative red. space. Yeah. Um, what I think that I, when I range. found public, the chapel, I mean, like I think of it as a yes. chapel, but I, I do think that when you have public art, generally what I've found is that if it actually engages the public rather than expects the public to just engage with it, um, there's a mm -hmm. difference. So I think that adding chairs makes a huge difference. I think inviting people to sit and actively actually just acknowledge that they're there. A, lo a lot of public art, particularly in Pakistan, doesn't acknowledge the public, right? It doesn't expect the public to participate in it. And that's for a variety of reasons that have to do with logistics and safety and uh, all of these things. Luckily, the room that we designed was not uh, particularly unsafe for people. It, it allowed uh, a certain amount of intimacy and it allowed a certain amount of interaction. Um, exactly. And you had another... Of... Mm -hmm. You had done another public piece, I remember, for the first Lahore Biennale. Yes, um, I had. So, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I, as well? It was a, it was a cube. Well, initially it was designed, uh, it was a gold cube, and it was. Um, I used some of the same panels in this one, but that oh, was uh, like a yeah. recycling. <laughs> yeah, well, I keep them in my house anyway, and there's nowhere exactly. else these would go. So I was really happy, um, but I regilded <laughs> them for you. <laughs> Thank um, you. But I also did want to use a. That I'd done like it was like a a box and it was it was not meant to be reminiscent of the Kaaba FYI but it turned out to be um, but I did think of like if you bring it if you bring uh, it's what is public art in Islam and to me the Kaaba is the, like the most obvious example of of uh, abstract art which is abstract mm -hmm. um, focal point and it you know it's just a box and there's so much symbolism in that. And so I'd wanted to exactly. use that kind of grid system and I'd wanted to do it in the fort. At the time I designed it to be in the middle of the quadrangle so that it would be oh. a quadrangle, like in the middle of the marble kind of platform and then reflections and lights and it would be very pretty. Uh, it's designed, uh, anyway, then we shifted it to Alhamra because of logistics and stuff. Um, in retrospect, I, I would rather have had that in a room, but it was good. Really? People in, well, I just because you can control lighting. Effect. That's true. But I quite like the fact that it was in the open air and I felt that people were really engaging with it. And I think yeah. that's one of the... A bit know, too much. That... <laughs> oh, well... I no, I mean, like, the weirdest that, thing was so. that, like, uh, for, there was an armed guard with it for a little bit, but, like, there was... It was it was cute, actually, because the Alhamra has a lot of um, cultural events or school events and stuff like that. So uh, the couple of times that I did go there afterwards, and Alhamra was kind enough to ask that they keep the sculpture after the biennial was done. Oh, and so it remained there yeah. for a year. Um, okay. And I was really happy about that. And people like these kids would come up and have their picture taken next to it and stuff like that. Eventually, it was destroyed when some of the mullahs went on protest against Imran Khan, I think about a year and a half ago, two years ago, a year oh. and a half ago. And they threw bricks at it. And I think that was just because it was on the way of their protest route. Great. Begging the question, what is the one shape that you're not going to stone? Because I thought that with the Gaba, I'd be safe, but no. So it was, it, it, but it was fun. And then people eventually I'm glad you the... managed to retrieve some of the panels. <laughs> I mean, the panels were there. The ones that have been destroyed, I've kept as archives in my studio in Lahore. I've kind of hung yeah. them up because they are actually fun. It's like you literally see the violence going through this gold, this brick being thrown yeah. into it. So it's like shatters and stuff. Well, I will not go into what of... I found inside the, the, the no, thing no. afterwards. But, but... Coming back to the idea of archives, what are the pieces that you've held on to or what is part of your own art collection? I think that both things are the, the other people's art that you collect and which of your own paintings. Have can you I show you decided? actually, if you give me two seconds, oh, yes, I can go please. and show you these paintings. Once, Actually, I think please you can hear do. me as I go. Because yeah, the funny thing do. is when I came back from Abhi, from uh, Lahore, I for something in my head said, okay, um, just take some things that you can keep with you in your New York apartment that you love. And I came up with um, 
there are these I do these series of paintings every time I go to a different place, and this is from a few years ago. But for example, this is a small painting that I keep. This is Istanbul, oh, um, and they're very tiny little pieces, right? They're not. Um, this is Nice. Um, that's so a places. little prominent. Places. Yeah, these are like little cities yeah. that I've been to. Places, Lyon, um, Venice, which uh, I, I go to every. Yeah. I've been trying to go to every, and I've always loved. But did you Venice. come to the Biennale this year? Sadly, your year the year that you did uh, the Biennale, I was the one year I didn't go to Venice. Oh no! <laughs> I, I usually go to the architectural thing, but I was so so uh, uh, sorely sorry to miss out on seeing it. Um, yes, but Venice is my favorite city, and yeah, no, no, no. Can you tell us a little it's bit about like? It, because it was, I've been, like, no joke, I have been talking about, Kumail, can you, I will, Omar, um, one second. It was, um, um, it, Venice the problem changed the, the way. The questions can't be seen. So whoever is writing, make, try and make the questions. So how about, in, like, we're not going to go on that much longer. I know you guys have been very patient yeah. with us. But uh, yeah, how about so at a certain kind. stage, we can kind of, like, then just open it up Answer. to questions and go yeah. Um, That's a good go on idea. From that. But I just did want to say that uh, Venice was particularly, I loved Venice for the same reason that I fell in love with Marrakesh was because I saw so much of Lahore in it. Uh, and there's so much of the, the imagery that I grew up with in terms of the arches. I mean, there's nothing that, <laughs> I don't think that you can compare the Ganda Nala to like the, the Grand Canal. I get that. I'm not, uh, I understand. Well, I tried to compare it to parts of Karachi, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I did find that the paintings that I keep are more personal paintings mm -hmm. um, and more sentimental stuff. I mean, like even in the ones that I've been showing you, there's, I mean, there are a bunch of kids paintings in this, um, uh, people that are close to me and I've been making them as children in a sense. Uh, so those are the paintings that I keep, but I tend to keep one piece. And it's a, if a, any of you listening are young artists who are trying to figure out what to do, you should always keep from every kind of five paintings that you make, just keep one for yourself, the one that you like the most. Um, because once That's these really things are gone, advice. well, the other piece of advice is don't show it to anyone, like never. So, <laughs> so most so of the paintings- So you can keep hold there. of it? Because at the end of it, like I now look back onto things when I was a student and desperate to make rent and I would sell paintings and I would want, to, some of those I'd like back, you know, and some of those are, to me, they're very important and they change the way I think about my work. Um, so there are small, like the first gold leaf painting I did, I've kept with me. Um, How I, did you first, make that one? We, I know we got a question about that earlier. So. I made my first gold leaf painting after going and seeing a show at the Guggenheim. And then there was like someone had done a gold leaf uh, installation there. And I thought, oh, gold leaf is a great thing. Oh, I, it was actually because I was in an, I, I was standing 500 feet away from something. Like it was way in the distance. It was like a little tiny thing, but it shone like a spotlight. And I was like, what is that? And I went up to it and I said, gold leaf. I was like, okay, that's great. That, that, it does its own advertising. So I've been using it a lot since then. This is in 2005, 2004. So I think the response to light is also so interesting. And I mentioned this to you earlier, but sort of with the lighting that you had done for the Saga Theater show, the colors of the paintings, because they were on gold leaf, look so different in many ways. Oh, yeah to photographs that you had put up on your Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's an unfortunate, it's a, I, part of it is because I think a lot of the, my photographer was not uh, able to document uh, gold leaf. I think it requires a certain amount of uh, finagling to be able to document mm. the paintings that I'm doing these days. They're not particularly easy because they do change depending on which light you're looking at them at. And I do think that gold leaf, the reason that I use it is because it makes paintings installation. It turns a very static yeah. object into a very moving Enlivened object. You get it. close to, yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes like, if I'm close to my, any of these works that are on gold leaf, their color changes depending on what I'm wearing. Their color changes depending on the time of day. And so it's really fun because the same painting will be three different people, um, or three different paintings at three different times of the day, which sometimes leads to the buyers being like, how have you, like, what's happening with this? The colors are off, it's like, wait till five o'clock. Yeah, well, they've been lighting it with like, they need to be properly lit. And it was super fun in your exhibition to be able to control the lighting. Yeah. Because I mean, you saw the difference between that place, between when it was just up and versus when it was, when it was lit. Gold leaf requires exactly. an intervention. Yeah. The, someone is talking, oh, actually, there's a little bit of Lahore. That, these are also pieces I keep with me. So that is a oh, poster lovely. from the first Lahore biannual. That one over here is my first trip to the Parthenon. 
and uh, that one is from uh, some time I spent in Santorini. So this is like a Greek, two Greek paintings. And these are some of the sculptures that I have. And I just did still lives with them. Um, okay. So yeah. you've mentioned this a little bit already through these paintings that you've been showing us. But what are a couple of key moments in your life or career that have really stayed with you? Is it one of these trips, for example? Is it a particular exhibition that you did the first time you used gold leaf? What do you think stayed with you and really influenced? Or oh, it didn't even have to influence. It could just be a great memory that you've held on to. Great memory, like a positive memory. It could be a terrible memory, whichever one you want. <laughs> without, um, without trying to sound at all bitter about it, I do think that the the way that the the cube, the gold cube, and uh, it's it's the, its relationship with the city and the way that that planned out, that played out, that did change the way I thought about the value of public art and not just the value of public art, but the the mechanics of it uh, in a place mm. like Pakistan. It's very different. It did teach me a lot about that. It did. There's a certain amount of self censorship that you have to, that you, uh, when you're working and showing within Pakistan is inherent, and I think it's inherent to all Pakistanis. Um, who are talking about what we self censor in a it's almost like a second nature because you have to in a way um there's certain things that you do not say it. yeah perhaps. but do you think that that happens I and mean, i've found living in different countries and cities and working in different art worlds that's not entirely only in pakistan where this right like you work happens. internationally in london yeah and, New York and, and i think that i have seen it in other places as well Often yeah. it's the artist, it may be the gallerist, it may be the city itself, but right. there are moments that the city stepped in. I mean, for example, a very interesting one was in Venice, where mm -hmm. I think not the last Biennale, but a couple of Biennales ago, an artist had changed all of the signs of the gondola stops with um, oh, yeah, Arabic writing. Or, and those were then, I mean, they were on for a certain period of time. And then the city, I think, stepped in and said, no, we want to change these back. Yeah, because there's a so limit it, to it, how much they want to change. Exactly. There's a, I suppose there's a limit to how much the city is open and willing to have artists intervene. So I think, obviously, in Pakistan, yes, there is self-censorship. But I felt that slowly, there's like, I mean, I saw this difference in this Biennale. The city had opened up a lot more of itself to the art world than they had done the first time. So perhaps there's hope that with every- Oh yeah, there's a learning curve with all of, of that. Exactly, yeah. I and mean, it is unfortunate that our cities are not used to public art in the way that they should also, be. I don't they mention, haven't had the opportunity. I, I don't mean to say that it's a bad thing. I think it's an amazing no, no, thing I know. you have like uh, parameters with which within which you have to work. Because one of the, like having, that's one of the reasons I'm drawn to Islamic art and flirt with the idea of what figurative Islamic art would look like because it is a very um, defined set of what you can and cannot do. And exactly. that is an uh, interesting thing to play with, right? Because who, and yeah. again, like whose rules are they? Because the Saudis are exactly. different, like the Wahhabis have different rules than the Shias. And again, with Shia art, not Shia art, but the art that I was seeing that was Islamic art was predominantly Shia art, which is portraits of Imam yeah. Hussain and portraits of Imam Ali and all of these things. And it was a very different way of looking compared to when you go to Umrah in, um, although I don't know if anyone's going to go to Umrah again, but like in, compared to like the imagery of Saudi Arabia, it's very different. But I do agree with the idea that you self-censorship, it's not a bad thing. I think every, there's no country well, in the world, great. as you say, but, but yeah. it's not great, but I don't know anyone who doesn't do it. I don't know any, exactly. it's not as if it's endemic only to Pakistan. I think the, no, exactly. a lot of people. Over a little bit, but now oh, no. is back. I know, and we just wanted to say bye because I yeah. realized it had been such a long time, actually. I'm so sorry. And um, everyone yeah. has been so patient and kind. <laughs> so cute. Thank you so much for doing this. Just, uh, if you want to, no. I think people are joining. Oh, fair enough. What else have we got to yeah. do right now? So, if you got any, <laughs> if you got any questions for either Zara or me, and yeah. I'd like Zara perhaps Please to talk a little know. bit about what she thinks of as the future of what's going to happen in the art world. Because as a practitioner, I'm just sitting here hopeful, but you probably know a lot bit more about the mechanics of what's going to happen. So, why don't you say a little bit about? where you think the art world will be and um, if any of you guys have questions for either me or I Zara, think let's please go let for them questions know. and questions? then we can okay yeah, sure so because it had I feel bad we've kept everybody for a while oh some people are saying keep going or dear <laughs> yeah 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 if someone asks a question we can keep going um yeah, but where do you okay. think the art world is going 
Um, I mean, I think a lot of people have been talking about this and wondering and not just the art world, but many, I think the world that they're wondering about. I am an inherently um, optimistic person. And I do think that, you know, there's a moment, it's great to have a pause, but I think that art especially is very much about the experience of looking at a live painting and really looking at being immersed in its presence in a sense. And I think that's something that probably won't go away. So I think people's relationship with live art is going to continue. But we were speaking about art fairs changing, perhaps maybe gallery mm -hmm. setups changing. And that's obviously all up for question. But I do think there'll always be a space for actual physical art and installations, video art, etc. So I think it, it will I be I difficult. So optimistic. I know. It will be difficult, I think, for a little while. But I'm hopeful that, you know, things may move not towards the normal that we knew, but towards a normal that's still stable and steady and helpful for artists. But there, I think artists that... do need support. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. One of the things that I do think that this, um, the social isolation kind of forced us all to answer was uh, who wins the battle of the screens. And it's not, it's not us. The screens have won. I think that like, there's a certain amount of, um, there's a certain amount of like push and pull between, oh, well, let's never give in to a completely virtual world because that's not something that is conducive to human connection. And I think that yeah. the biggest change that Corona brought recently was how wrong that is and that like everyone has now retreated I know I can speak my sister has been in a one-sided battle with her kids to try and like iPad time right like every kid I know is on their iPads all the time and so for mm -hmm. like years ago it was like oh don't spend too much time on your iPad and now their schools are on iPads everything's on iPad yeah. that question is kind of relevant to artists in the sense that whatever we were flirting with with the idea of like uh, Instagram and its power even now, to be a, a vehicle I mean, for artistic look at this expression, for example. right? But like now, I I can't speak for anyone else. I am super aware of how paintings photograph, for example, because I know <laughs> that ninety nine percent of people are not going to be able to see them in real life. They're going to see in them reality. on Instagram. Most exactly. of the guys who are joining will send me messages on Instagram. They won't necessarily go to a. Um, they won't. They're not able to go to a show, right? Like there's so many shows that I love around the world that I'm not even, I can only experience online. And it changes stuff like scale. Suddenly paintings that are like this big feel like the, and vice versa. A lot of my work, yeah. people don't know it, is that large when they see it. It's enormous, right? yeah. No, and also a lot of museums are opening themselves up. I know, well, my older sister um, works with Google and she was uh, working with the Google Art and Culture Project. And now I think what oh, Google's right, yeah. doing is also that. so interesting. What's that? Yeah. Oh, just, yeah, we're both looking at the the just comments. the question. <laughs> yeah, because there's a good question. There are actually a couple of them. Zara, do you have anything coming up or something you would like to work on? Oh, I you think... can scroll backwards. Sorry, I didn't know you could do that. Malini <laughs> this... from Mumbai says, Hey Kamal, think the world. What do you think the new normal is changing attitudes to collecting art is going to be? That's an interesting question. I think that art is investment. I don't know what you think, but I think art is investment for, will not change after this as a concept. Mm. What do you think? No, I don't think so. I, I think people like holding, owning things, really. I think we yeah. as individuals like having things that we can trot out whenever we feel like it, look at. And with, also live the, the value of a Van Gogh has not, I don't think the value of a Van Gogh will change between a year and now. It That's might change a little bit, but it's also yeah. there's the value of art. It's not like we'll suddenly look at art objects and say, okay, now you're worthless. I think that and art has survived actually generations, years. That's something that's also so amazing about it. Mm -hmm. That yeah. the artists, I mean, it sounds very cliche, but the artists may die, but their artwork and the movements that they've started. What a carry wonderful on. thought as I live in the pandemic. <laughs> there we go, Kamel. Thank you. <laughs> You'll survive us. <laughs> <I'm> a... <laughs> uh, Hashim Kaleem says How accessible was the Sagar Theatre exhibit? Felt like the subject slash class explored in the artwork wasn't really present in the audience. Mm -hmm. Language might have been a barrier as well. Well, one of the fun things I found about the, the artwork, the show that you put together, was how little it relied on language and that so much of it was visual and didn't require. Uh, a base from which, you know, it doesn't talk about highfalutin uh, art historical concepts and so much of it, I think, from my perspective, because I didn't see any of the artwork prior. We had not discussed that. I mean, I discussed oh, yes. mine with you, but everyone else's, I didn't know what they were doing. And so it was really, I found that 
I because I went there. I have a team of people who work with me, as you know, um, in Lahore. And a lot of them don't speak English, but and they one is Yamin, who's like my <laughs> like a piece of my heart. He's the reason that my life in Lahore works. And he and I would go around that because he was helping me the most. And I was um, I was grateful for how you would set up that space being aware Thank of you. something like that particularly in the class structures of Pakistan that said i do think that anywhere that has a gate and a guard like in, inevitably is always going to be less uh, it's also i think about the public going to artwork right we you have to it's not necessarily something a lot of pakistani uh, or gen- south asian audiences generally you know like go and Actually, see what was interesting even. was that um yes of course it was gated it is the private property but in most of the exhibitions that i do i try and have invigilators who are able to take people through and that isn't about class or language it's very much because what you said earlier about public art pakistanis or people who've not i mean we're not used to contemporary art and i know that if i go to an exhibition and if i don't know the artist from before if i don't understand their work i also sometimes struggle to understand what's going on so to make it easier for people to interact with the artwork we often have invigilators talking them through the basic points and creating little tours for them just for people to feel that they're able to access everything easily if there are any questions that they have they can feel comfortable asking them and so that makes it easier for a lot of people to come by and we had i mean the sagar theater show which was in the plaza cinema was across the street from the police station and it was next to various different stores and shops and we had a lot of people coming in from there we had little local kids who'd come in to cuz um we'd revive the balcony of the cinema and put up a sort of screen and projected short films so we my favorite day was actually when we got these little kids who were playing cricket on the street they came in and we put on some of the films for them to watch and then took them around the show a little bit yes. i mean yes some of the work was a bit more adult in content i wouldn't say it was classist in any sense i think it's more about younger no, no. kids not being and also this, able we to have to see or use ourselves with the notion that art for some reason has to be universal it's never been that it's never tried to yeah. do that it is if one is truthful about art, it is the most elitist cultural product that humanity has ever created there is no sense of art the art world particularly there's no sense of the art world that is at all um generous in the way that it views how it how the mechanics work the moment the money dries up art moves right high end art they will it'll all just i'm not talking about the production of art i'm talking the consumption of it it is it has always gone to people who had the most money people who had the most because that's they have the most to invest in these kind of um and patronage, monuments to grandeur right patronage patronage yeah, the idea of patronage, right? patronage. Yeah, yeah, patronage is quite important so i'm just trying to see if we have any other questions thank you i think the lbf i think the lbf does a great job by the way in terms of what yeah. they do in terms of their it's not easy um to arrange it's very, a very show difficult. like that what i do oh, think that you. one of the ideas that i did have about public art particularly in a place like pakistan or anywhere actually in south asia i think it's 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 a lot easier to include public art on people's routes than it is to get people to reroute themselves to see public art so if you're going on a main thoroughfare it's a lot easier if you can just put up a sculpture or a piece of work on a on a chalk or on a roundabout or on um, in pakistan in lahore at the security checkpoint right like why don't we have more art mm-hmm. around that when people are stopped and staring at something that's when i find that it would be useful to have that that actually changes the city to me because it maybe doesn't... maybe in the future i think what you said earlier about slowly the city also embracing art and kind of loosening its hold on certain things is true and i think probably eventually that will probably also start happening but you're very right i mean we and as cities we do have sculptures on main thoroughfares they may not be contemporary art sculptures but they are, but they are there in many cases oh the anatomically ambiguous horses that we have yeah I've seen those. Yes, and there's the also flowers, like the glass flowers in Lahore. The glass flowers, also the actually, tank. You've got to love a good tank. What I actually really, really loved about the Lahore Biennale, this is really sorry, continuing on, we should end soon, was the planetarium, which I think had. Been oh, you know, I never got to go years. see. Yeah, it was beautiful, and I think it was really important to highlight the treasures that the city has. I mean, obviously, Lahore is. I don't know how many of you know this, but it's a Mughal jewel. and many of the mogul 
buildings, the architecture is still very much there. And the Biennale is also using that. But at the same time, we also have little modern jewels like this planetarium that a lot of school children would go to, I think, when they were younger. A few aunties told me about this. And it's been closed for many years. So the Lahore Biennale opened it up collaborated with some artists, had artworks placed within it and enlivened it once again. And I think that was very generous of the city and the Lahore Biennale Foundation to try and find spaces that have been closed and, you know, oh, yeah, allow the public to really enter them. It's great. But, yeah. it's great. Does anybody have any more questions? Because I feel as When will you do something similar off. to the Venice Biennial in London or the UK? I don't think there is anything similar to the Venice Biennale actually um, on the global stage right now, but let's see. Um, oh, yes, Yusuf Shabazz is saying the planetarium was amazing. Yes, it was. So is Amra. Um, let's see. I have to say, um, I try and do one show per year or so, and in many cases, they're not, it's quite spontaneous in some ways as well. So mm -hmm. it's when inspiration strikes that I put together another exhibition. For example, these conversations really were not planned at all. And I mean, this I thought about yeah, it. Yeah, what are you days. thinking about doing with these? Are you going to, like, is it going to be a weekly thing that people can join in on? Or? Let, let's see. I, I think I'd like it to be a weekly thing, probably at the same time. So I stopped spamming all of my lists on and my friends on WhatsApp. So maybe try and make it as concrete as possible. But right. Thursday is 9 p.m. perhaps. I was fiddling with the idea of doing twice a week, but I think that might be a little bit too much and um, maybe keep it going on for as long as possible, because I think it's fun to speak to artists and show that there's so, obviously the paintings are a huge part of you, but there's also other things that you have. And I think I that's love... nice to highlight that. Amra Khan wants to see that jacket. Yeah. <laughs> the jacket oh, again. Oh dear. I love I, it takes, it would, it would, it's like my mother taking out her wedding dress or something. It would require going into like a, Covered in the deep guts of my apartment, which I can't do. But <laughs> oh, exhibition versus ESC. Can you give us some do's and don'ts to make gold foil last longer on canvas? Well, oh, first, really? it's not foil; it's metal leaf, but it is kind of similar. Foil is harder. Um, you have to seal it, and uh, you have to seal it with a varnish uh, to make it last longer. And that is a much more uh, difficult process than I had at first imagined. <laughs> but if you want, you can di you can direct message me or something, and I can give you more advice about I that. I think someone else messaged me about this separately. They had said, please ask Kumail to give a gold leaf painting class tutorial on Instagram. I can so do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To do that. Yeah, and I think I will sign in for that as well to watch because I'll think do that. Can I've. Uh, yeah. I'm terrified of Instagram and going public and stuff. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Sure. I think it would Same be fun. Here. Let's all guilt together. Um, I've yeah. actually got it's a, a little bit of uh, gold leaf that I squirreled away when I ran here, like Maria von Trapp. Okay. Well, now it can be music. put to good use. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah. Komal, how about a live paint? Komal would love to. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway. No, I know, I know. It, so wasn't, I, it wasn't a read on you. No, no, I know. I, know. I, I knew. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way. You know, for the uh, longest time, people kept calling me camel in America, which I didn't know whether it was just racist or not. <laughs> Zara is easy enough, so most Zara people can easy. manage. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I quite like my name. I have Zara is also a really good Starbucks name when you have to give it at like when, what's your yes, name? You tell them yes. your name my for an order. No, my sisters actually use it when they're ordering things on the phone. They'll just say, oh, it's Zara. It's like Zara is the name because it's so much easier to say. My Starbucks yeah. name is Michael. Oh. Which is very but confusing for a lot of people when they look at me. And yeah, I not, to pick not, up not the at all. <laughs> Taha Ahmed so asks, works. how is New York? New York is not great. Oh, we spoke about that. <laughs> we yeah. spoke about it. You can go back. Yeah. Hopefully we can figure out a way to record these sessions in the future and then we can come back. But I think... Yes, I'm going to try and figure out how to do that. But guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Kumail, for taking thank our you. time on a Thursday morning or afternoon rather at this point. Yeah. And for joining me for this very first unplanned and... We're both learning at Instagram. I think we did Artists a good job. Unplugged. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little yes. strange that they yanked the plug out at about an hour. But, uh, that's yes. <laughs> well, now we know this for the future. But thank you so much, everybody. And thank you for tuning in all. I think 60 of you right